It's early morning on the Indonesian island of Java. Garuda 200 cleared for descent, runway 09er. Surface wind is calm, visibility is 8 kilometers. A Boeing 737 flies high overhead. Copy that, runway 09er. Wind's calm, visibility 8 kilometers. 27,000 feet. 27,000. The crew of Garuda Flight 200 is getting ready to land. All right, you can go ahead and proceed with the landing checklist. Landing lights on. Approach frequencies check. Indonesia is made up of 18,300 islands, so air travel is incredibly important. Garuda is critical to the aviation infrastructure. Fasten seatbelt light is on. There are 133 passengers in the cabin. They're nearing the end of a short flight from the Indonesian capital of Jakarta, 265 miles southeast to the city of Yogyakarta. Most of the passengers are Indonesian, but there's also a group of Australian journalists. They're covering a state visit by Australia's foreign minister who's traveling on another plane. Relationship between Australia and Indonesia are often strained. So whenever a minister, a head of state, visits that country, there's a, a, a heightened uh, interest from the media. Um, and so we had a large media contingent following. Kyle Quinlan is also headed to Yogyakarta. He's an Air Force security officer, part of the foreign minister's advanced security team. I was working for 34 BLP squadron. They're the guys who look after the security for Prime Minister, the heads of government and stuff like that. We had to travel internally on civilian aircraft. The plane is about 15 minutes from touchdown. The speed is 320 knots. OK, when we're cleared, we approach runway 9, course 088. Captain Mohamed Marwoto Kumar has been with Garuda for 21 years. Approach flaps 40, auto brake 2. With their speed approximately 141 knots, on landing, parking stand to the left. As they near the airport, he briefs First Officer Gagam Rakeman on the final steps needed to get their plane on the ground. Understood. Approach briefing complete. This was a typical day out for these pilots. The captain was very experienced, the co-pilot a little bit less experienced, but uh, certainly just another day at the office. Uh, a short flight, easy. Enough slack and it's time to get back at it. Yes, sir. No life like it. For Quinlan, the flight's been a welcome break from a hectic schedule. We just come off a 16-hour shift the night before. We had probably about three hours sleep, and um, so it was kicked back and just like relax and just enjoy this time before we get on the ground and before we have to work. The plane is less than 15 miles from the airport. Oh, strong wind. They hit some slight turbulence. What will challenge you in tropical latitudes close to the equator is the fact that the weather there has a, a greater exchange of heat and therefore you're going to get more wild winds. And you've got to be on your toes as a pilot. Garuda 200, you're clear to approach runway 09er. Let me know when you have the runway in sight. Copy that. The bumpy ride doesn't alarm the experienced captain. Flaps one. He continues with a landing approach. Flaps one. And calls for the flaps to be extended. Flaps increase the wing's surface area, adding the crucial extra lift needed at slower speeds. Gear down. Gear down.
They're now less than 3,000 feet above the runway. Flaps 15. You're in this position of taking this big bird and putting it into a slow enough airspeed with enough configuration on flaps and landing gear and so on that you're a little bit vulnerable. As the plane descends, Quinlan begins to feel uneasy. His Air Force training tells him something's not right. When you travel on aircraft so frequent, you become aware of, of your surroundings. And for me, it was when we were just standing and looking out the window and thinking, we're not supposed to be at this height for how fast we were going. <laughs> Something's off, huh? Good to left, two miles up. Quinlan can't shake the feeling. The plane's dropping too fast. When I realized something really bad was going to happen, I turned to my boss and I said, We're going in. OK, then. What can you do? You're stuck here, you know? Like, there's nothing that you can do except for tighten up the seatbelt and just hang on and, and just ride this out and hopefully we make it, you know? We we landed and, and um we bounced. It's chaos as the plane bounces a second time. And I just remember thinking, just hang on, hang on, but hang on. Then a third impact, and the plane isn't stopping. We're scraping on the belly. I can hear the wings, the engines, everything. And probably the biggest impact I've ever had in my life was um, when we hit that embankment. Emergency crews race towards the crash site, but the 737 has careened off the runway into a swampy rice field. Getting vehicles to the site won't be easy. When you've got a crash that occurs in the middle of an airport where there's plenty of access, it's one thing. But when it's out off the airport site, in this particular case, in a rice paddy, uh, very limited access, it gets almost exponentially more difficult. Many passengers are badly injured, and fire is spreading fast. Kyle Quinlan realizes there's no time to wait for rescue. Once we pulled up, I had to operate, and to see so many people who were busted up and couldn't do anything, I needed to do something and, and to help these people out. Inside the burning fuselage of Garuda Flight 200, Kyle Quinlan struggles to get out. Fire is blocking the nearest exits. The whole plane is just, there's all just the glow and the heat coming from the, from the right side of the aircraft. If the fuel tanks ignite, the plane could explode. But firefighters can't reach the crash. Anytime you've got the possibility of fuel, you need fire suppression right there, right now, because you've got massive flames at 1,800 degrees, and you've got a lethal situation. <laughs> Quinlan still can't get out. Turn on the left, jump across, grab, grab the emergency exit with another Indonesian guy, and, and crack the emergency exit. Passengers scramble out of the door. People are climbing over each other, and it was pretty well seen. We've got to get you out of here, now! Quinlan's sergeant, Michael Hatton, is too badly hurt to get off the plane without help. He was unconscious and falling in and out of consciousness. So I carried him out, jumped off the left wing tip uh, into a rice paddy, and then uh, so he sank up to sort of knee deep in, in water, about 100 meters away from the, from the aircraft as a hut. I just grabbed my boss and carried him there. Come on, yeah. Come on. I just, I can't. Oh. 
You all right here? I can see his injuries. They're not uh, life-threatening. So look, you'll be right here. I'm coming back for you. You'll be, you'll be right. Off I went and, and uh, went back to the plane. Freelance cameraman Wayan Sukada also makes his way off the plane. He soon begins capturing dramatic images of the aftermath. We've got the cameraman grasping for breath. We've got him staggering around away from the aeroplane, filming as he went. And you've got this trail of people coming away from the aeroplane. It was raw unedited and it was a real sense of being there the fire and the intensity it was a uh, massive you know like it, this thing was um huge explosions going off big plumes of black smoke just how, 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 how the aircraft was burning it was just phenomenal like i've never seen anything like it back on board the plane Quinlan helps more passengers escape a cabin that's fast becoming an inferno. A lot of people were not in, in a condition to be able to do anything. So I'm in a condition where I can assist. I'm going to assist. I'm going to do the best I can and, and help, you know. The scene was one of chaos. On one hand, you've got a, a lots of officials not knowing what to do. On the other side, you've got passengers almost looking after themselves and rescuing each other coming away from the wreck. You've got emergency services who can't get to the aeroplane because of the terrain, because of the ditches and the rice paddies. It really was chaotic. Of the 140 passengers and crew on board, 21 people have been killed. Clearly, you knew that people were not going to survive this. It's almost a miracle that so many did survive. Sukada keeps rolling as crash survivors, including Kyle Quinlan and Michael Hatton, arrive at a nearby hospital. Australian Air Force. Air Force. That was the stretches and everyone over the floor, you know, and, and um, it, it was just a big shock to me. Just so many people. Within hours, Sukada's dramatic footage is broadcast around the world. The public response to that footage was overwhelming. Millions and millions of hits on YouTube. Television stations around the globe picked it up and it was repeated continuously for, for days after the crash. At the crash site, investigators from Indonesia's National Transportation Safety Committee, or NTSC, faced the enormous task of piecing together what went wrong. Aircraft debris is spread all along the plane's deadly trajectory, from the runway to where it came to rest in the rice field. An airplane is basically uh, a, a, an aluminum eggshell. It is incredibly strong when it's used the way it's designed to be used. But if you skid it off a runway at high speed, it's not going to stay together. Alan Stray of the Australian Transport Safety Bureau joins the investigation. What have you got so far? We have to establish where did it touch down? Were there any runway marks? Did it bounce? Did it skid? What are the distinguishing features on the runway that may help us build a picture of what was happening at the time of the accident? Let's get the full team out of runway nine. Stray knows that the relatives of the dead are already demanding answers. Because there were so many international people on board this aircraft, some of whom had died, there was intense pressure to deliver. Investigators search for clues to explain why Garuda Flight 200 bounced off the runway and crashed. Looks like they hit pretty hard. They discover gouges and shattered pieces of landing gear on the runway, clear signs that the plane slammed down with unusual force. The nose wheel digging in and fracturing was indicative of a very hard G-force on that impact. It's also clear the plane hit the runway more than once. 
Musket Max here. The idea of walking the site is to establish the sequence of the events. First impact here. Being very careful not to disturb any perishable evidence. So, one, two, three, but off the end of the runway. There was uh, a lot of questioning and trying to establish why did the aircraft bounce? Hang on a minute. The location of the first skid mark gives investigators a crucial lead. How far are we from the threshold of the runway? 860 meters. Yeah, because that's more than a third of the runway. It landed long, it didn't touch down till a long way into the runway. The distance of the touchdown from the threshold raised serious questions in the minds of the investigators. So, he comes in long, he hits hard, and bounce. Let's gather up as much weather data as we can. We're very keen to uh, establish, was there a weather situation, a wind or a downdraft, a, a strong tailwind? Stray suspects wind shear might explain what he sees. Like this, and like this. Wind shear can produce violent updrafts and downdrafts that are impossible to fly through. Close to the ground, it can be deadly. Especially in the age of climate change, we've got more and more violent winds, uh, gust fronts, downdrafts, things of this nature, and sometimes microbursts. Investigators check with tower controllers to find out what kind of weather the pilots were facing as they descended toward the airport. Here, take a look. Surface winds were completely calm. The weather data shows there were strong winds at high altitudes. But the winds near the runway were calm. There's no sign of the kind of downdrafts that could force a plane to the ground. That wind tapered right off, and there was ample time for the crew to establish the aircraft in a stabilized approach from 1,000 feet. Indonesian police launch a criminal investigation into the accident. They bring the captain in for questioning. For crash investigators, the move has unfortunate consequences. I really have nothing more to say. I'm sorry. In cases where the investigation becomes criminalised, and particularly when that happens early on, if we have uh, police involved or, or lawyers involved, we did everything by the book. Uh, that can intimidate people and uh, it can lead to them not cooperating effectively with investigators. With the flight crew under criminal suspicion and reluctant to talk, investigators must look for other leads. Downloading the plane's black boxes or flight recorders is now a top priority. Investigators quickly recover them from the wreckage and send them for analysis. All right. Let's get these the lab. The flight recorders are, are vitally important. It's important to get as much information from them, early information, so that it may direct the thrust of the investigation. Without that data, we're screwed. Meanwhile, investigators focus their attention on the crash site. Every detail is a possible clue. What I want to know is why they didn't stop at the end of this runway. The investigation was initially concerned about the touchdown point and the remaining distance on the runway. Is that the runway map? They wonder if after coming in long, the plane simply didn't have enough runway left to stop safely. Even with a two or three mile runway, you've got a finite patch of concrete on which to land an airplane. A touchdown here, 860 meters from the threshold. Now that gives him just over 1,300 meters to stop. The runway in Jogjakarta is shorter than the runways at many other international airports. But even though the pilots touch down late, Stray calculates they still had enough room to stop their plane. He had more than enough runway. The length of the runway was completely adequate for a Boeing 737 landing. Investigators need to dig deeper. We need to know why this plane didn't slow down once it was on the ground. 
I want to take a close look at everything. They begin a painstaking analysis of the major mechanical systems on the 737, especially those designed to help the plane slow down and stop on landing, brakes, spoilers, and thrust reversers. Was there a mechanical failure? Looking at the performance of the aircraft, was it physically possible for the aircraft to stop? The careful analysis of the plane's mechanical systems provides a potential breakthrough. I think we got something here. A review of the maintenance log for Garuda Flight 200 turns up an intriguing lead. There had been a write-up uh, on a couple of occasions of thrust reverser failure on one thrust reverser. The thrust reversers redirect the jet's engine exhaust forward to help the plane slow down on the runway. You've got to remember, it's not just a matter of kissing the wheels onto the ground. It's a matter of dissipating a tremendous amount of energy, a tremendous amount of kinetic energy. How do you do that? Well, you do it with the friction between the tires and the runway, hopefully using anti-skid. You do it with reverse thrust. <laughs> Thrust Investigators wonder if a malfunctioning thrust reverser explains why the crew couldn't stop before they ran out of runway. Full break! At the end of the day, you still have to dissipate all that energy, and if you don't have enough room to do it, you're off the end. But it's another dead end. According to the maintenance records, the faulty thrust reverser was repaired before Flight 200 took off. Looks like they fixed it. That had been rectified prior to uh, this flight departing from Jakarta, and uh, so there was no uh, paperwork evidence of a failure. Investigators are going to need another lead. We don't deal in uh, speculation, we want facts. The facts so far are limited. The 737 careened into a rice field after slamming to the ground almost a third of the way down the runway. The question is, why? Was the plane configured properly? Perhaps there was something wrong with the wing flaps pilots rely on for landing. The flap system on a modern jetliner like a 737 create greater lift. And, and that means that we can approach an airport, we can take off from an airport with a much lower and safer airspeed. The team scrutinizes the mechanical rods or screw jacks that move the flaps. We needed to look at the flap setting. What flap setting can we establish from the wreckage? We measured the screw jack extension to establish what the flap setting was. What they find is astonishing. Doesn't look like the flaps are all the way out. The screw jacks show a flap setting of just five degrees, not nearly enough for a safe landing. We just could not believe that the aircraft would have landed with only five degrees. To provide enough lift on landing, the flaps of a 737 are usually extended step by step from zero all the way to 40 degrees as the plane slows and descends towards the runway. It's hard to overstate the value of the flap systems on a modern jetliner. Investigators aren't sure how the flaps ended up at only five degrees. The flap mechanism was damaged in the crash and may have moved on impact. To be certain of how the flaps were set, they need to know what's on the flight recorders. We need that data from the black boxes. Some of that data is proving elusive. Australian technicians have been unable to download the cockpit voice recording. It's a huge blow. If you don't have access to the CVR for whatever reason, then uh, it's very difficult to understand what went on in the cockpit. Desperate to hear what's on the device, investigators send it to the U.S. manufacturer, hoping experts there can recover the recording. So steps were taken to 
hand carry the recorder to the factory so that the data could be downloaded. Crash investigators are having better luck with the second black box, the flight data recorder. They've managed to download all of its stored information. We were able to get information about the flap settings, the speed on the approach, the thrust reverser deployment, the dynamics of the approach and landing itself. The data reveals the 737 was coming in for its landing blazingly fast. Flight 200 hit the ground at over 250 miles an hour. More than 100 miles an hour faster than normal. We're not stopping! This is a ridiculous amount of speed to approach an airport with, uh, with the intent of landing. The plane's speed at impact is so fast, it bounces twice before skidding into the rice field. The speed of the aircraft on short final and on touchdown is so excessive, there was no way it was going to stop. But why did the pilots touch down on the runway at such a catastrophically high speed? Pull up the data for the flaps, would you please? There. The flaps were set for five degrees. Never more than five degrees. The data confirms what the screw jack suggested to investigators. The flaps on Flight 200's wings were in a bizarre position, one that is never used during landing. It's not operational procedure to land with flaps five unless there is a jammed flap and it cannot be extended. Investigators are left with an alarming possibility that the plane crashed because the pilots touched down without performing one of the most critical steps needed for any landing. To hear an airplane that has been in an accident because of overrunning the runway had a flap setting of only five in a 737 is very disturbing. Why the crew failed to set their flaps properly remains a troubling question. Meanwhile, media reports erode public confidence in Garuda Indonesia Airways. The, the accident affected negatively Garuda's reputation, but they had had other problems in the past. In 2002, Garuda Flight 421 was forced to ditch in a small river after both engines flamed out. And in 1997, Garuda Flight 152 slammed into a ravine, killing all 234 people on board. Garuda's record at that stage was just a series of accidents and incidents uh, with large numbers of people losing their lives. In the wake of this latest disaster, Garuda is banned from landing at any airport in the European Union. The fate of Indonesia's national airline could be at stake if investigators can't figure out what went wrong on board Garuda Flight 200. Finally. After a painstaking data recovery process, investigators can finally listen to the cockpit voice recording from Garuda Flight 200. Fortunately, the recorder specialists at the laboratories are uh, a tenacious breed and they do not give up easily. But will the sounds captured in the cockpit shed light on the decisions and actions of the flight crew? Okay, let's hear it. Okay, well, we're clear we approach runway 9, course 088. Investigators listen as the crew discusses their plans for landing. What you're doing is listening for the, the atmosphere and the tone, the ambience, if you like, in the cockpit. Approach flaps 40, auto brake 2, with airspeed approximately 141 knots. On landing, parking stand to the left. Now they know they need 40 to land, but they only get five. What's going on? Approach briefing complete. At first, there's no sign the crew is worried. The captain certainly doesn't sound stressed. Then the first hint that something is going wrong. Looks like we're not going to hit the glide slope. The plane is too high for this distance from the airport. Better get down a little faster. Mm -hmm. 
To land smoothly, planes need to lose enough speed and altitude to descend gradually and meet the runway at a shallow angle. Flight 200 is much too high. Okay, he's a bit behind, but it shouldn't be a problem yet. Stray compares the descent of Flight 200 with the flight path they should have been flying. It is not unusual to be a little behind in terms of slowing down and especially in terms of descending. And sometimes you find yourself high and fast and uh, you've got to make a decision. He definitely has some work to do if he hopes to get on track. Check speed, flaps 15. Flaps five. Captain is calling for flaps 15. Why is he saying flaps five? Flaps 15. Something is very wrong in this cockpit. Check speed, flaps 15. The captain repeatedly tells the first officer to increase the flaps to 15 degrees. But the first officer never moves them past five degrees. Flaps 15. It's like they're not even in the same cockpit. Landing demands precise crew coordination. But as they speed towards the runway, the captain and his first officer seem to be ignoring each other. There's a lot of evidence that this crew was not thinking it through. They weren't situationally aware. They weren't communicating. OK, first things first. Why did the first officer ignore the captain and leave the plane at flaps five? It's very perplexing. If you've got professional pilots, we can make mistakes. But usually, that's why we've got two people up there, so one catches the other. Investigators suspect the high speed at landing explains the first officer's decision not to increase the flap setting. Way too fast for flaps 15. Flaps can be damaged by excessive drag. And when the captain calls for flaps 15, the plane is speeding at over 250 knots. Much too fast to safely extend the flaps any further. Flaps 15. The plane is moving so quickly that wind drag could tear the flaps right off the wings if the flaps are extended past five degrees. I can very well understand why the first officer did not comply on uh, going to flaps 15. They're grossly overspeeding flaps five. Uh, the first officer was exactly right in not putting them down. All right, they were moving too fast to deploy the flaps. But why didn't the first officer say something? Tell the captain to slow down. One of the issues was that he, he didn't communicate his reasoning for uh, not responding to those uh, commands for flap 15. He didn't communicate that to the captain. When you take a pristine Monday morning quarterback look at this, regardless of airline, regardless of culture, it's very clear that the co-pilot should have said, Captain, I got the airplane. But what it tells me here is that this co-pilot did not feel that he could speak up one way or another. Even more bizarre, why didn't the captain react to the loud alarm sounding in the cockpit just moments before the first impact? Go around, Captain! Go around! Landing checklist completed, right? It's a tough one to ignore. There's nothing subtle about it. The ground proximity warning is a clear signal to a pilot that he's flying dangerously low. Well, there were 15 ground proximity uh, alerts and warnings during that final stage of the approach. When a crew member hears that, there should be instant action. Instead of aborting the landing, the captain does something that baffles investigators. Go around, captain! Go around! Landing checklist completed, right? He asks the first officer if the landing checklist is complete. Landing checklist? I never heard anything like this. When the co-pilot called for the captain to go round, and the captain responded, landing checklist complete, it was just something that we could not understand. I was appalled. This was industry worst practice for crew resource management. A pilot ignoring 15 warnings, ignoring two pleas by a co-pilot to go around, and landing 79 knots too fast. This was atrocious. For investigators, the question remains, 
why did the crew continue with a landing that was clearly heading for disaster? Personnel files reveal both Garuda pilots are fully licensed and certified. The captain in particular has many years of experience. But his dangerously fast landing attempt and the poor communication in the cockpit lead investigators to question the quality of the crew's training. So there was a much deeper uh, look at what training had been provided to the crew. Weak situational awareness and coordination. Poor communication. Unstabilized approaches. A review of training records for the entire airline uncovers a disturbing detail. This is not the first Garuda crew to have problems with a routine landing. We noted that in 2001, an analysis had been conducted and there was a number of instances of unstabilized approaches or fast approaches by crews. The finding shines new light on what happened in Jogjakarta. Investigators may finally be zeroing in on the cause of the Garuda 200 disaster. Play that last bit again for me, would you please? Investigators believe Garuda's poor training record helps explain the deadly landing in Jogjakarta. High quality training for pilots is absolutely critical, especially when they face a crisis. It's one of the few things that can help a pilot avoid a strange psychological phenomenon known as fixation. Fixation is when we are focused on uh, completing a task uh, to the exclusion of other things that may be going on around us. When you see people uh, as egregiously ignoring all the warnings and the systems and the bells and the airspeed and everything else here, you've got people who are fixated. Nothing was getting through to the sky. Investigators theorize that the captain was so fixated on descending to the proper altitude that he didn't notice his speed. And even when the alarm sounded, he failed to realize that his plane was in grave danger. It's hard to imagine how somebody could get to that point, but we have a lot of flaws. And part of the flaw in, in the case of a pilot fixating on a runway is that he or she can blank out the rest of the advice, the ground proximity warning system, everything. Training helps combat fixation by reinforcing standard procedures designed to ensure pilots can break the spell and take in the information they need. Oh, go around, go around. Go around. Landing check was completed, right? Better training might also have helped the first officer overcome his reluctance to correct the captain's mistake. Without question, if the captain wasn't going to respond by going around, which is what he should have done instantly and hearing whoop whoop pull up, uh, the co-pilot should have said, I've got it, and done the same thing. Digging further into the airline's operations, investigators discover another factor that could help explain the disastrous landing. Fuel efficiency incentive? Garuda recently introduced a policy that rewards pilots for saving fuel. In this case, it was a, a, a bonus that would be applied if people uh, minimized the fuel that they, they used. Aborting a landing and going around burns more fuel. But the captain denies he was trying to save fuel at the expense of his passengers' safety. He did not at any time seek to excuse his actions by blaming the company's policy. We learned in the 80s that we had to get inside a pilot's head. We had to try to figure out what the state of mind was, whether he survived or not. Uh, in this particular case, the state of mind, it has to be so bizarre in terms of the fixation on getting this airplane on the ground that it's really hard to understand how any professional airman could get there. In 2008, Captain Marwoto Kumar faced charges and was found guilty of negligence. But the conviction was overturned on appeal when the Indonesian High Court ruled that prosecutors failed to convincingly prove their case. The public reaction was one of horror to this crash. 
particularly as the details came out about what the pilot had been doing. The fact that he had ignored 15 warnings. He'd ignored two pleas to go around by the co-pilot. He was approximately 80 knots too fast on touchdown. These elements uh, just really portrayed this as a cowboy operation. In their final report, investigators urged the airline to scrap the fuel incentive policy. It's just not a good idea to introduce a scheme that may compromise safety in order to save costs. The report also calls for improved pilot training. We can't change their behaviour, it's already happened. What we can do is to try to uh, uh, change those conditions that influence their behaviour so that we can try to prevent this from happening again. In the aftermath of the Garuda 200 disaster, the airline overhauled its training and safety protocols. The European ban on Garuda was lifted two years after the crash, and today it is a safer airline than it has ever been. The impact this crash had on Garuda was a watershed. They completely went through the operations department, the flight department, they've changed everything about the airline. It went from a pariah in the industry to a well-respected airline today. But for the survivors of Garuda Airways Flight 200, difficult memories remain. It took me three days before it caught up with me. The adrenaline, everything in your body, it, it just, everything was racing. And then, um, yeah, we get back over and it dust that all sort of thing. And it just broke down in, in, a, in a heap. In recognition of his heroism, Quinlan is honored with one of Australia's highest awards the Bravery Medal. I was blessed that, that, that I can still walk, I can, I can help, help people, and, and I, I, I just try to help people the best that I could. You always want to do more, though.